Okay. All right, call meeting order at 6.02. Um, we'll rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Sure. Call. Yes. Steve Degelow. Here. Ian McDonald. Here. Aaron Blargen. Here. Lisey Oster. Here. Bruce Blargen. Here. Danny Erickson. Here. Matt Pugol. All right. Uh, Mr. Carlton, <coughs> together we engage, educate, and empower all learners, bridging their passions and pathways to create successful futures and positively contribute to our local and global communities. Um, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. And the two, uh, Louis, you are up for public comment. Okay, so the superintendent wants a taxpayer supported daycare. On the outside, daycares. Can you just say your name and address? Okay. okay. Louis Duran, 2021 State Road 35, Somerset, Wisconsin. Thank you. Okay. okay. So the superintendent wants to start taxpayer funded daycare. Outside daycares pay a mortgage, property taxes, something the school doesn't. So why would they need $129,000 a year to, to run it if they're charging the same rates? How could a taxpaying daycare compete against that? In the schools they are showing that have daycares, they're all in Polk County. Somerset student numbers have been dwindling since 2010-11 school year. That year they had 1,653 students. Students enrolling out has been growing every year. Last year was 154. So if you took that 154 students in last year's enrollment number of 1,463, that puts you at 1,617. Still less than 2010-11. So the numbers at the school are going down, the village and township are going up. Here are some numbers from the St. Croix County Comprehensive Plan, going back to 2010. Zero to four year olds is down 13%. Five to nine year olds is down 7%. 10 to 14 year olds is up 4%. The ones having kids, 25 to 34, is down 24%. The village population from 2010 to the first of this year went up 699 people. Township's population from 2010 to the first of this year went up 469 people. The group moving to Somerset, St. Croix County, the greatest group, is 45 plus. They're coming without kids. So why does the school want to compete against taxpaying daycares? You got the track and auditorium you said you needed to keep kids. How about working on the problem with the 154 kids leaving? And remember, your parent engagement survey 64% said no. So I have a question. Are you going to fill this daycare with students from the outside that are not in Somerset School District? If so, that's completely wrong. Because government should not compete against taxpaying businesses, especially if they need taxpayer money to keep it afloat. Building permit numbers are down. Last year, the village had 46 permits. This year, 11 so far. The township last year had 24, this year 14. So how about we fix the problems? Don't add to them. And how about doing a complete survey on this? It's a lot of money to get this thing started and going. All right, um, next item is a uh, report. So listening session summary. <coughs> Uh, Danny, you were here? Okay. And Lacey, anybody here? Laurie. And Laurie, anybody here? Oh, or yes, yes, yes. There, were, there was a family here, and um, they um, asked about DoorDash uh, delivering food. Apparently it was allowed at the middle school, but not at the high school, and they're wondering why, and asked if we have a policy about this, and as far as I know, we do not. So perhaps this is something that uh, the high school staff could look into. Was the family saying they wanted it to be yes. at the high school? Yes. Okay. But, but if you could just check in. Sure. That. Yeah. And um, they also um, 
expressed concerns about some racial bullying and I will share those details with you later so that you can contact the family in person or you know, personally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thanks Lori. Uh, superintendent update. Um, yeah, so I have two things. Um, so I have Leslie Thomas and Dave, I kind of mentioned last meeting that they would be here to help kind of answer maybe some more in the weeds questions just regarding the current proposal. Um, not looking for any action, just continuing to provide some information. Um, if you click on the um, presentation that's linked to the agenda, um, there are a few added slides toward the end. I highlighted the top of those in yellow. Um, so you could see which ones were added, the rest were still the same. Um, wanting to just kind of hit on a few things, either from some questions that I had received, um, you know, some feedback, those kinds of things, just trying to bring some more information to be able to, be able to answer some questions. Um, and then obviously, as I said, Leslie and Dave can help answer some things too, because Leslie's kind of the resident expert on all things childcare. Um, so I wanna draw your attention first to slide 10. If you wanna go down to that one for me. Um, we pulled together again just you know some comparison in terms of just fund 80 in general in terms of uh, districts around us and their utilization of that fund this is not necessarily broken down into um, what they use it for some of them use it for things very similar to like our school age care program um, some of them use it for obviously a whole wide variety of things it might be community ed um, I didn't necessarily break it down into that level of detail, but just wanted to kind of show you a comparison in terms of how other districts or the fact that other districts are using uh, Fund 80 for a variety of reasons. Um, if you go to the next slide, 11, you know, we've had a lot of conversation internally about um, just kind of rates and what does that look like and how does that compare? Um, you know, Leslie, I'm gonna have you kind of speak to this a little bit. Um, you put a lot of work into gathering some comparisons and just kind of what does that look like so you don't necessarily have to stand up there if you don't want to but oh, it'd be easier yeah you probably can't see <clears throat> so just in regards to this so this is information that um, I reached out to child care partnership which is the agency that works directly with DCF it's considered our local resource and referral agency they are located in um, Eau Claire but they are the ones that come out and do all of our pre-licensing and um, answer any questions regarding um, trainings and um, they pulled the information based on their data that is collected every um, year. This was uh, actually pulled on um, June 27th. So this is most accurate as of June 27th. So these are the rates that are average, uh, maximum and minimum amounts for those age groups across St. Croix County. Um, they do not have a way of pinpointing just Somerset or just New Richmond or things like that. They just do a county overview. So then what I did was I took the county average and started at the zero to 11 months and calculated what the revenue would be if we were full capacity at each one of those levels. And then I took the maximum amount here and did the same thing so you could see a range of income that could be brought in. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell what that represents. I don't know if there's questions about that or. What was your operating cost again? Was that, was that, was that, in, that was in a slide earlier. I don't remember the numbers specifically without looking at it. What did you say for a second? How much was the operating cost? Oh, it's, it's later. Yeah. And I'm going to touch on that again okay. in just a All second. Right. Yeah. Too, no, thank you. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. That was helpful. I think as we've looked at just, you know, again, kind of estimating and trying to zero in on, you know, if this was something that went forward, what would those rates look like? You know, um, a lot of the feedback beyond just, you know, the five or six that were on this presentation and talking to other districts even around the state that have done this, um, you know, kind of the constant theme was ensuring that you don't start too low. Um, and, you know, really being cognizant of, you know, certainly trying to put it at a price point that's family friendly, but also, you know, recognizing that this kind of is a separate entity and running it, um, you know, like a business to a degree. Um, 
I'm going to kind of go to the next slide just to kind of hit on a couple of the, the bigger questions that I've received. Um, maybe you've had the same. Maybe these have been your own questions as well. Um, you know, but kind of the idea of, you know, our current school age care program, um, you know, is self-funded. It's sustained kind of all on its own. You know, so why would a potential daycare have to run in the red? And, you know, what I presented to you in kind of the, the slides below it essentially is almost worst case scenario is the best way to describe it. That um, the idea would be certainly a, a large investment up front, um, you know, knowing that within a year, two years, three years, that the idea would never be to have an a unlimited um, number of years in terms of having that fund AD levy. The goal would be eventually for it to be able to break even and then that second step would be then to have it you know, be revenue generating on some level. Um, the districts that I've spoken to uh, kind of range between you know, two to four years in terms of you know, the time it took them to be able to break even after that initial kind of investment. Um, but a lot of that conversation I've had with those superintendents really again wraps around fees. Um, you know, from the get-go, I would say it, it, it probably is pretty close to possible of looking at how to break even, um, but that would be where the fees come in, right? That higher fees, right, give you a, a better opportunity to do that. Um, knowing that, again, the goal certainly isn't to have this sit in fund 80 forever. Um, the reality is, you know, again, big investment up front, and then, you know, just like any other business, I suppose, it would take a little bit of time to be able to get back to either break even or breaking some, or uh, gaining some revenue. Um, but again, just looking at kind of the research we've done, what we put together, I would say like the information I have on slide 14 um, was at least a, a reasonable starting point, but that's without looking at, you know, what would it look like if we put our, our rates on the high end versus that medium end? Because right now, that this is kind of based off of that that median that medium fee structure. Um, you know, this incorporates ten full time staff uh, with full time benefits, uh, which is obviously costly. Um, you know, so we could look at doing some things a little bit differently for staff, but there would be a bit of a trade off there, which we've talked about um, in terms of you know continuity for kids. Um, it's easier to maintain staff full time versus trying to piece staff together that are part time. Um, but, but things like that could be looked at and certainly could be done. We kind of presented the, the Cadillac version in terms of what we think is best for children. Um, you know, but there could be some ways to, to help navigate that too. So, um, Leslie, anything else that I'm kind of missing? Oh, I do have a, sorry, a few other questions on, on uh, slide 12. I kind of just addressed that second bullet point. Um, our proposal right now would be 10 full-time staff. Um, you know, that would be dependent on obviously number of kids enrolled that could go up, it could go down. Um, and I did specifically have the question of, well, what would it look like if you hired part-time staff? Would that decrease costs? Um, it certainly could. Um, but again, we run into some of those issues in terms of um, retaining staff and, and trying to piece that together versus having full-time staff. But it certainly could be done. Um, one other question I had had, um, someone asked about this boardroom and if that could be used or would be used for the program. So we've had a lot of discussions of trying to maximize kind of every square footage in the space. So our recommendation would be that this would become kind of a large motor indoor room uh, for students. And by that time, we'd have a space such as the auditorium or somewhere in the other buildings that we certainly could run school board meetings. But I know Leslie had shared with me that um, in all the programs she visited, that was a common theme that each of those spaces had in, a large indoor large motor area for kids to be able to uh, to work in right now that wouldn't be possible unless we use this room so ideally this room would transition into part of that program and we would have to find a different spot for school board meetings but so <clears throat> I have a question yeah don't we um, do we have grants for is it just SKC that we have the grants for? We don't have yeah, so right, right now, the ones that I'm emailing out to board members every month, mm -hmm. that is a result of COVID dollars still, and um, the efforts of uh, the governor still trying to keep it on the docket as a long-term um, option to help support programs stay afloat. Um, as of right now, round five, which is what I just sent you today, I don't know if you saw the email, 
That is the last one that is secured in place that'll go for, I think it's eight, we'll get eight payments for that. Outside of that, we don't have any answers as to whether or not it'll continue. Um, from what I can tell and what from what we've been emailed is that plan on it ending. But there's still efforts in the background working to try to get something from a state level to help support programs. If that were to be the case and we open a child care, they would also qualify for those funds. Um, so it's any child care regardless of whether it's infants all the way up to school agers. Um, and we've looked for some too, you know, even just like for the startup of yeah. to right knock down that that we have not found yet. If anyone listening knows or is aware of something, please send it to me. We haven't found it yet. But. Yeah. Um, the, the, the top question, I don't know if it was actually, if you touched on that in terms of answering it, but probably the biggest piece of the difference between what school age is doing and what a child care would do would be the number of full-time staff. Um, and that's where the difference in the cost is coming. So, yeah, and I, between, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, I, I can see the upfront, you know, cost being support or being asked for to build out the space. <coughs> yeah, for me personally, I would think that we would want to run it so that we can be making money out of it mm -hmm. and not have to keep. Mm -hmm. I know there was a, we don't know how many kids we would bring in. I think it would be, I think. I've heard from people that they want more daycare places in town, but there aren't enough, and that they're going to Stillwater for daycare, or they're going to other places, the center, or whatever. So, I, and I think with the school, you're dropping your kid off at one spot. I, I think it'd be great. I just would, my goal would be that we're not paying for this for. And like that's our goal years. too. That that's be, absolutely our goal. Um, those fees are I think set. when we put it together, it was what would be absolutely ideal if I could have everything I want to ask for to open a childcare, and that's what this looks like. Now, scaling that back, and are there things we can look at? There are, there are. Um, but there are a ton of moving parts that when you're not in the field, you're, you don't know that. And so please ask questions, and I will do my best to answer with the best information I have in terms of making it simple and, and, and tangible in terms of how it would apply. Um, but there isn't always just a black and white answer to, to a lot of the questions when it comes to, to operating a child care. But um, yeah, please, if you have questions, I so, welcome them. So did you say you had 86 spots, Shannon, roughly? Correct. And on that survey that we did take already, so 81 families said they would use it, mm -hmm. right? That's probably more than the 86 spots. Well, and if we only had 300 people respond to that survey, yeah. Yeah. And I do believe that survey also included people that may not have had children. Yeah, I think I touched on this last time. Like, yeah. if you took the survey, you had to answer that question by, but still, even if by my own mistake. Right. 81 say that they would. Yeah. I'm just, I, like I said, to, to limit that mm -hmm. possible chance for being over budget right away. I know we're going to be discussing this yeah. more, but I'm just really concerned about the capital outlay for a project like this. Uh, it's it's a it's a lot of money um, when we've got money issues, right? So, where should our focus be as a district? I just uh, I have a lot of doubts about the viability of this, and also competing against private businesses. And to follow up on public comment too, like how can how can we get something out there in the next, before we have to make a decision to get the community involved, taxpayers, people who don't have kids who are paying for it? In terms of like a survey? Of, yeah, survey. Yeah. Asking, what, what do you see that looking like? We, does, the, does the community want to pay for it? Just to, um, I don't know if it would be uh, a mailer sent out, if people would see that, or if you have email for everybody in the district? The district, for sure. Okay. Yep. That's Beyond, I didn't know if you meant greater community. Oh, just the district. Oh, okay. whoever's paying. No, hold on. The district. Families? No, or you're talking, taxpayers. You're talking Sorry. whole, yeah. all taxpayers. Yeah. In the, yeah. yeah. Who would be paying? Yeah. 
know, I I get it too. I, I mean, if we're going to ask for whatever seven hundred thousand dollars, that's a big ask for people. I I agree, and I I hear the hopes of that it would fund itself, and that that would hopefully bring people in sooner, and that would keep people here. I know that was kind of your how do you gauge that? Yeah. So okay. I. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think with that, if that was something that went out, like, here's the intention of it, you know, here's the thought behind it. Um, kind of just Steve saying other, like, private, has there been any other, um, has there been any talk with other daycares in town? I attempted and didn't I, get I a response. Just, you know, because I, I think mm -hmm. as a competitor, but trying to build community ties. So um, there are only four licensed daycares in town. One is a center and three are home providers. Yeah. Um, everybody has waiting lists because oh, yes. the community okay. does not have enough childcare spots for the parents that need them. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of competition, I don't see it as being a direct competition. Okay. If they can't take more children, right. you know, they're, they're not out anything and, and we would be able to help be a service to those families that, that need care right here in Somerset. Um, I've talked to several families that are leaving the community because they don't have childcare. You know, so from that standpoint, um, you know, I I'm aware that there's four mm -hmm. that are licensed. How about the? And I know you can't foresee the future, but just when you say ten full-time staff in a daycare, you know, setting, I know it's hard to find find staff in general, I mean, do you think that that's possible? Well, part of the thing is, is if, if we were going to um, be full in every single room, which was those numbers that I had said, um, and just figure out what we would need for staff to do that, mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't take that many kids till we had enough staff, staff yeah. to support it. So that would also fluctuate cost. You know, so that's why I said, it's not black and white <laughs> because everything, fluctuates based on number of kids that need care, based on number of staff that I have. We are required to follow state licensing guidelines. And so there are specific guidelines on how many children per staff we can have. And so, you know, if I have one staff person in the baby room, I can only have four babies. I can't have eight. When I get to that sixth one, I need a, a, another staff person, um, those kinds of things. So there's a lot of pieces that are moving. Is it uncommon for daycare centers, um, for teachers in daycare centers to get benefits? Or is that common? I would say the school, the school ones that are providing daycare, um, there are several that are giving full benefits because their staff are working 12 months a year, yeah. eight hours a day. There are others that are not. But it is a practice that is Can we, can we review the fund 80 cost for the first initial year, second year? Did we go over that last time? I mean, I just want to be clear on what those costs are. The ones with Aqua Slide? That's where we transferred into fund 80 equipment cost. Yeah, it's on, yeah, it's on 13. Yeah, it so, Forty dollars per hundred thousand. So if somebody has a three hundred thousand dollar house, three times forty, forty nine, correct? So it's hundred twenty dollars for the one, the whole one time cost of that, correct? Dave, do you want to speak to any of the tax stuff? <coughs> I guess I did look at the, uh, the Department of Revenue estimates for counties that they released last. Excuse me, before you um, continue, I people say all the time that they can't hear you. So if you could come oh. up to the podium so that we get it on the video, that would be great. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. <laughs> so Mike right here. <laughs> um, I don't have a lot to update on this I, I was saying I did uh, look at the Department of Revenue estimates for counties uh, for 
property value uh, growth equalized values for the district uh, that they released last week and we can use those to get a good estimate of what the district uh, property values will be that is then released in October to us. So it's not the exact number, but it's pretty close based on the proportion uh, of each municipality uh, that's within the district. So just kind of doing some math, getting a close estimate. Um, we've been using an, an increase of 8.5% uh, property value for the mill rate. Um, and our estimate right now is about 11.5%. So it's not a huge change. It'll make the, those numbers a little better. That's the mill rate update. Still taking it in. I think it's. I think it's a big ask. Our taxpayers. The only thing I'd add is. I don't know what the average home price is in our district, but I'm guessing three hundred thousand might be conservative. So for type four, that's yeah, 160 per taxpayer. One, one year. Mm -hmm. And um, my understanding from talking with other um, school board members and districts that have this, um, they recoup this cost down the road, correct? So, for example, in, I think it might be St. Cray Falls, I talked with several people, but um, they recouped their initial investment in like four years, I believe, and it is such a huge success that I, they're opening a second center. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's now a money maker for their district. Right. Yeah, I guess initially when I saw the presentation last time I looked at, we're gonna ask people to put 700,000 out, and then we're gonna lose money on this in hopes that we're getting people here to boost our open enrollment or get people here first. I, I can't, you know, that was mm -hmm. tough to swallow. But, you know, to know that they're making money in St. Falls or that we, you know, you're kind of being conservative here setting our fees you know, that that's more comfortable I guess but again I, I understand it's a big ask up front and I don't know what other people have had how much Cedar Falls asked to outfit their space or what other people have asked yeah it's been a mix um, you know some have, have built brand new buildings just for this as a part of that initial layout um, some are doing exactly what we're doing of just some construction to try to transform something you already have into something that will fit to meet code. Um, you know, one of the districts ended up, because their uh, enrollment has decreased enough, they had some empty classrooms and empty space in one of their elementary schools, so they kind of transformed those spaces into, you know, so it, it's a mix in terms of how people have went about this, I guess. Based on, based on what I know about the industry, the childcare industry, um, I mean, obviously there's no guarantees, but I am very, very confident that we will be full with the waiting list. I just feel like that is, there is such a huge need in St. Croix County period, and there's so very little options here in town um, that I, I wouldn't be standing up here telling you that I think we should do this if I didn't honestly believe that I think we would be filling our spots, you know, but that's just me and <laughs> my. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've talked about open enrollment and trying to get people here sooner and not go to Hudson right off the bat or Richmond or wherever to start school because you know, they have daycare there, then they start school because they're bringing their kid to that daycare in that area. I mean, people are coming here to bring their kids to here to this building and then drop them off at that school. 
I mean, I get how it could turn this, and we've, we've asked for how do we maybe help open the moment, and I think, I think it's a positive step. I, I don't know who could look at that initial investment, maybe, and see what we can do, and then possibly add things later. I, I don't know. I don't know enough about building out a daycare, what you need versus what we want, or I, mean, I think, and maybe the other one is it sounds like maybe in some type of survey. I don't know how we go about getting more community it would require input. a lot of education to put out about what exactly we're talking about and what the impact would be before I think that we could get um, informed responses to the survey. I don't feel comfortable making a decision about that. Though. Okay. The survey or the? Just or the I would have to talk to Well, the decision, to, well, whatever the. Well, there's no more uh, action. On I, know. I know. I know not to me. I mean, sorry. Go ahead, see. So it's not just the the money and the outlay. It's the fact that we're competing with private businesses. Churches could be involved with this, I would think. I mean, we've got three in town. Uh, that seems like a logical place to go uh, to work with that. You know, a nonprofit organization like that, a faith-based organization, uh, rather than the school doing this. Are you saying that they have the inheritance? I'm saying that maybe he approached the churches in town if there's such a need. You know, they've got space, they've got empty classrooms, I would think. They would be sitting in a position to have to do exactly what we're doing, though, so I don't know. I don't know. I'm just. Well, and it's more or less the belief system. Do we, is, is this school the answer for everything, uh, the school district? We have private business, we have home daycares. If there's a big need, you would think uh, outside of the district, there's solutions. That's just my point. Yeah. And I think, yeah. I think it's a great thing to bring up. <coughs> what I can tell you from the data that I've been getting and things of like that, just emails and things that we get is the whole state of Wisconsin is in dire need of childcare, yeah. period. It doesn't matter where you live or, or any of that. There are not, there are a lot of providers that have gotten out of the profession, which makes it really difficult for working families. So um, it is a, it's, it's a need across the state, not just in this community, but yeah, it, it's a thing. <laughs> yeah. I well, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, we're talking about this right now, Shannon, because we kind of came came to you saying, what are other things we can do? What are other things we can do as a district to try to get more enrollment, try to get right. more people here, try to help? I mean, and I I agree with lots of the things being said. This is it's a lot. It's asking, but I mean, I commend you for coming up with an option. You know, it it might not be the the best option, but I I mean, I think it's definitely something that. It, it took a lot of time, like there's a lot to this, it's a lot just to start, and I think it's not just that we're providing a daycare, it's that that's going to, in hopes then, increase enrollment, help keep staff that have young children. I would like to, is there any data that we could get for districts that are already having this? I know we're talking about St. Croix Falls, that you know, we've talked to people, but any like actual numbers as far as what they've seen I don't well, know that's 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 toured. I toured five mm -hmm. which are within an hour from us mm -hmm. um, and spoke with their directors some of which I should say most of which did not have it would need to be something that came from Shannon in terms yeah. of a question from a superintendent to a superintendent because not all of the directors are involved in the budgeting piece of it right. um, what kind of data are you looking for more so, I mean, compared to what they would have put down for initial costs and running fees, and then what they're getting for um, money coming in. You know, I just, and I think so. it, that's probably hard to necessarily, and then it's hard to measure 
okay, is someone staying in the district? I mean, some of those things are, are tough, but I think just, I don't know. It's paying for itself, and it's a service, again, that we're offering community, and it sounds, and like I said, I've been told, too, that we don't have enough people that are going elsewhere. If we can provide that service you know, at the school, I think that's a good thing to do and offer. I mean, what, so when would you need something from us? Or what do you need from us? You know, by when? Obviously, we need more input, we need more information, but like, when do you need? Well, I think we're looking at putting this on the next meeting for either recommended approval or not, as it would run through Fund 80. So the opportunity to levy for it this year right. um, is in October. And I think to clarify a little bit of what you're asking, the, you know, the upfront cost probably is different in other districts than here, whether they build or whether they had space. For here specifically, it's for code, it needs to be sprinkled and the classrooms need to have exterior door access. So that's what the majority of that cost is based on um, for this building. And so I think you did, you know, just recapping your discussion, it sounds like, you know, the startup cost, that's a big question. That's something that you need to consider um, and supplement with whatever information you need provided by us. I'm hearing that if you look at the higher end of the St. Croix County fees, you'll see that that pretty much covers what we're expecting as a deficit. So if you're saying, off the bat, be self-sufficient, then the fees would be high, which is an option, absolutely. And on the expenditure side, we'd look at how can we staff this maybe where it's not 10 full time. What are the options on the staffing side to decrease the expenditure? What are the options on the revenue side to charge fees higher? You know, and I, I can't speak to whether or not that impacts demand or enrollment, but staffing is proportional uh, to enrollment. You wouldn't hire 10 people or 15 uh, if you had one classroom worth of students. So I guess the point is the big upfront cost is kind of hard to change. Um, the ongoing operational um, is flexible based on those factors. They, it could be at the higher end. Uh, for the county for fees charged, but that's an option. Okay, so, so are we looking for some <coughs> information, Shannon, from you from other districts of maybe how long and what they're making on this and when they started making the money possibly? Is that something you can yeah. look mm -hmm. in to find out? Um, see maybe some additional what their upfront costs were just to have to see when they were paid off. Um, any other information people want if we're looking, so you said in what, what meeting in October? Would we well, to, Bruce, I should also just be real clear about this. Uh, if they're making money, right, and they're paying it off, this is all the money stays in Fund 80. So it could be used then to expand and create more space and expand the program uh, but it can't be used for, you know, operations or for sports or for anything else in the district. But it could be part of the money in Fund 80. Yes, it, it stays right. in Fund 80. It has to. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you might help set your set your number. Right. So that it's money in, money out. I thought that's one of the other things I read about Fund 80. It's supposed to be money in, money out, mm -hmm. not a big surplus. Not a savings account. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like if you're, you maybe would not increase fees, right, to get that more in line with the area or, or whatever the case, but it, um, yeah, you can't fund other things. With it. So you, you couldn't technically pay off your initial investment, is that what you're saying? Right, there's no way to pay that to anything else. Okay. What else is, do we want? So when, when was the date? Sorry, when was the date? Uh, it's our last meeting in October. Okay. 21st. 21st. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, I was curious how detailed the information we have on the 81 inches that, because if there's 82 year olds, you know what I mean? Yeah. What's the spread on age on that? Do we, do we know that? No, not based on how the, it was an anonymous survey. Doesn't that make, make a difference? October wouldn't be our only shot at this. If somebody wanted to try for a referendum, they can do that now in November too. If we want to do a referendum for this? It's all you then they can't argue with it. <laughs> Like some information from other districts that currently have similar programs, timeline from what was their initial investment and how long it took to either break even or potentially start gaining revenue. Yep. Yeah, I don't. Um, and then, well, now we can't save money, but um, and I guess how would we, would it be worth another survey again? I, I don't know. send one out to all community how that typically works. That would be our district newsletter mailing list. And I don't know off the top of my head how much it costs to, um, it wouldn't be as much as the district newsletter, I wouldn't think, because it wouldn't have to be full color and it wouldn't have to be as many pages. Well, like you said, the information in there. to scale it down to go to Ian's question more so to target because the initial survey was sent out not in the mail correct it was just correct. sent out through the, yeah specifically targeting those people that sh like showed interest to gain more well they have no way of knowing who those are because it was an right but if it came out to say something to the fact that like, yeah. if you were one of those people that were interested can you provide us with some more I would district say wide. another district-wide survey just targeting that. Just targeting program. if you yeah. are if you are someone who is interested in this program. But to Ian's point, if you put it on referendum, people will just if they don't have the information, they might just check no without right. knowing all. Right. Yeah. And the other thing about sending out an email survey to just those who are currently enrolled in the district because those are the only emails we have. It would go up through Infinite Campus or something like that. Yep, typically. Then you are missing all the young families yeah. who don't have kids in school yet. Right. Ooh, uh, so we need some good information sent out about what this is to these families. It's on that flyer again. And I think something that have to go out relatively quickly um, and then so that we can kind of review those results again I guess before we would say yes we want to approve it at the end of October because the community is saying yes this is something we support or we could fill it or okay, that's a big ask I know I so I feel like to accurately get information and to create a flyer and to make sure it's out that's in, a, in that timeline, I feel like it's not really possible. So we're talking about mailer, is that correct? A flyer? Well, I, I guess the only issue with the mailers I come back to is we have, you know, we've done them for the referendum and we get, you know, pretty minimal feedback on those. So I don't know. I, Grant, I want to I want to hear from people if we would get back I don't know what the percentage is like 18% or 20% we get back so that is nothing but at least we get community input back well do you have something with it? I was going to say a referendum is open to vote right and as fund 80 is there's no vote for the public so I think there that's there's a chance for a lot of heat to come come down towards us to us we don't communicate the costs involved Cost benefit analysis. It's really that simple. Mm -hmm. 
So what would, what would, eventually when all this revenue comes in from this, what would that, how do you shuffle that toward other things in fund 80 and what would those things be? What would that look like? I guess I'm not sure what the question is. Do you hear uh, so fund 80 can carry a fund balance. Um, typically in the past, uh, it's gone up and down. Sometimes some of the things we've tried previously is to start a um, community ed program, and that typically loses money. Um, and in the past was supported by school age care kids club um, revenues. Uh, I think typically districts, if they didn't have some other thing that they're trying to do, they would not necessarily continue to build their fund balance. They would say, well, we don't need to increase rates. Costs generally go up every year, but they would slow down their revenues most likely. So lacking some purpose, uh, some objective, uh, generally you wouldn't just keep accumulating revenue and holding on to that. Could, could we pay on the, the items that we were planning on putting in there? Could we like decrease the fund AD ask and pay like SRO or those foot legs. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. could be covered to that. Yep. It's not, so fund 80 is the umbrella. It's not, um, you know, segregated within the fund that things must remain in a specific program. So yes, we could do that. Okay. Is there a maximum you can raise through fund 80 per year? How does that work? Uh, it's community and, and board discretion general. And this amount, since it's a one time, it's a startup, it all has to be in your money. Like there's no way to do <coughs> this amount to say we're going to do half this year, half the next year. I think. It just out of here, I mean, because I. I think just based on. As we talk about the number, where the, I mean, it the is, cost estimate came from, the, the work that's being done, it's big costs are, are sprinkling and, and putting doors in. Yeah. So I don't know if that would be, Bruce, maybe you know, is that something you can do in two years rather than one? Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, you could, it would just take longer to open up. Yeah, which then in. you're... And, and the, the cost probably wouldn't remain the same. So what does it take to get a referendum question on in the run? Can we still do that or not? There's a deadline. I can't remember when it is. Well, it, I believe it's passed. Yeah, we say it's over. Is it? Mm -hmm. I can double check, but. Can... Okay. Well, unless someone has missed something else, maybe we just can't keep asking around people's thoughts. I don't know. I don't know what we want to do with a survey if anybody has any thoughts really on it. Well, Shannon, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think it's a little bit of a short timeline in terms of kind of putting together flyers and mailers and things like that. Um, I mean, if that's the directive, we can, for sure. I think at the very least, you know, sending something out district-wide, at least as a start, would be good. Um, and when you say that, you mean like through email and even at campus? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, at least as a start. I mean, we, I don't know, we could put something, if we're um, looking at kind of greater community, we could put something, I know this doesn't reach everyone, which is the hard part of, you know, on Facebook or website and kind of file people there to take it. Um, you know, putting out a mailer, and what's your what's your estimate on? Could we put something in the? I mean, quick turnaround, but in the calendar, is that go cool? I guess I don't. If we we're gonna do it, I'd prefer it was a standalone, probably. Okay. But I can get um, some prices and things. Let's see what you can come up with before the next meeting about putting out a flyer or a, and then let's work on getting something out to in the scoop or through the, at least through the district families mm -hmm. to get more info. Because we got 81 families 
through that. Ages and who would use it. And mm -hmm. So how many children and the ages? Would you know, if we can get some of that in September, and even you know, if we can have some pulled together by the end of September, and two weeks back, we should be able to get it pulled by the end of October. And I'm not making that ask until the 21st. At least we have some community input, you know, other than what we're asking, you know. Yeah, yep. An option. Moving good. Okay, uh, Shan, superintendent goals. Uh, yeah, um, so I, they are linked. Um, I will just want to take one pass of the paper copy as well. Um, Okay. Um, all right, so what you have in front of you are, um, after kind of going through, um, looking at, again, strategic plan, kind of what we've got going this year, some focus areas, um, three specific areas that I will focus on uh, in terms of collecting evidence, reporting out to board. So I'll start with uh, goal one uh, is, of course, the strategic plan. Um, that's obviously one of the biggest components of my work. Um, looking at implementing all of our year two action steps. So you can see underneath there some measurables, uh, identify the year two action steps, which actually I've already done at our uh, previous meeting. There are 12 of those. Uh, collecting evidence on those action steps with a goal of 100% completion of each of those. And then present information to the board regarding progress of these action steps at least three times per year. Uh, goal two and three are a little bit more student achievement uh, focused. So this year will be the first year of our required implementation of Act 20, uh, which is being implemented uh, statewide. Uh, so supporting that implementation and overseeing that implementation specifically in our elementary school. Um, also with having a new curriculum director, uh, that'll be important to support that work with her as well. Um, so attending building and department meetings regarding Act 20 and collecting evidence on all these things. Attending internal and external training regarding Act 20. Uh, reviewing grades K-3 required universal screener performance data. Uh, so technically starting in January, we're required to give a universal screener. Um, we are actually going to try to implement that at the beginning of this year so we can at least have a, a run through before January, but uh, helping to analyze and review that data. And then presenting information to the board regarding Act 20 at least two times per school year. Um, so you might remember you know, the training for this actually started last year with our staff, uh, going through half of the top 10 teacher tools. Uh, this year will be the second half of that, and then again, implementing all of the, what I would consider lengthy requirements for Act 20. Um, not only the training, but again, uh, the universal screener, we're prescribed which exact screener we have to use. Um, looking at that data, and then uh, creating plans for students that score below a certain threshold as well. Um, so there's a lot that will be happening with AT20, so um, overseeing that, which again has a direct uh, tie to student achievement. And then goal three looks very similar to, I've had this goal the last two years, um, but I think it's important to continue to have some accountability with the bi-weekly meetings with principals and directors, reviewing their goals, 90-day plans or individual goals, evidence of progress. Um, that second bullet point is something I added in this year presenting information to the board regarding the progress of the 90-day plans for each building at least two times per year, uh, which is something I talked about when our uh, principals and directors were here last meeting. Attending at least one staff meeting per month and then weekly building and classroom walkthroughs. So um, continuing to evaluate what's happening with our curriculum, our instruction, um, and how that relates to student achievement by working closely with our principals and directors. So. Those will be the three things that I will specifically be collecting evidence on. Of course, everything I do in a year can't be summed up just in these three goals, obviously, but those will be the three um, areas of focus in particular. More to come. So if anybody does have questions about them, you would like them just to follow up with you Great. in the next yep. two weeks or something. Are there any questions now, I guess? So, if you do follow up with Shannon in the next couple weeks, you're good. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, any questions about the financial reports? 
Okay, uh, moving on to the next item. For 2024-2025 budget update compensation recommendation discussion possible action date. Thanks. So I'll start with a little bit um, of budget discussion and, and specifically uh, we'll review uh, how last year ended up, 23-24. Uh, and so we'll go uh, from the website again. website looking good page looks a little different financial reports are still up top on the right the uh, quarterly budget to actual reports um, we have 10 years of these now so our final one for last year we'll jump into that And uh, don't hesitate to ask questions at any point. I'm not gonna uh, go through it too slow. Um, it's very similar again to prior years, except what, what's the end result of the year. And we'll look at the closer examination parts for the things that we kind of keep track of on an ongoing basis. Uh, you can see, I summarize what's in it, what's in the numbers. If you look at the end of the report, you can see the cash flow of the last month always jumps up because there's things that are booked on expenditure and revenue um, that are either just booked on paper or they're yet to be paid payrolls or they're yet to be received uh, revenues. So that all ends up in June. That all goes into this, um, our final numbers. The numbers we talk about throughout the report don't include the transfer from Fund 10 to Fund 27. Um, I mentioned it at the very end again in the summary where when you do include that, we're at 98% uh, of, of the budget for Fund 10 expenditure. Uh, excluding that here, you can see the number this year versus last year, 97.7% on the expenditure side. Uh, some of the breakdown by summary codes sorted, sorted by the, the expenditure. I have some notes below. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Some of, the, some of the higher percentages and some of the lower percentages uh, are a result of a budget being allocated to one area but broken down and coded to other areas. So there's a fair amount of that interplay going on um, in our coding uh, and our budgets year over year. Here's the final pie charts, the budget, and then where we ended up. Um, and I should step back and emphasize again, this is um, really good estimates. It's not final yet. We had our auditors on site the last week of July, first week of August. The audit is ongoing, uh, and they will have their report done in December. Um, and I report our numbers to DPI at the end of September, so it's ongoing. These are really good estimates is how we should think about this. Here's Fund 10 even more summarized and compared to the prior year with the bar chart. By object, uh, the what of the expenditure. Um, and again, I have a couple notes up top just about how budgets are allocated and where they can end up being expended. Um, for instance, capital objects here ended real low that doesn't mean that that wasn't expended. Most of that was within IT codes. And this is just an example of one area. Um, but they didn't, in their plan, they weren't spending it on um, equipment this year. It was more on services. So they still ended up very close to their, their budgeted amount of expenditure. It was just coded differently. Here's our closer examination. Uh, you can see this is a good, a good example of there's good examples under budget, there's good examples over budget. I have some notes uh, regarding that. What you see there down below, um, obviously the, the winter was 
very unique this last year. Um, saved a fair amount of money on the gas and overheat. The electricity, um, I think partially was um, less being used once construction started in the elementary, for instance. Uh, snow removal, we still had some snow and we still had some cost, though it was, if you look at last year, our record high, it was much different. Um, so you can see the department budgets, the ECCP tuitions. Legal is, is back on track now, I would say, to closer to what we expect the last couple years. Uh, transportation ended high, sub wages ended high uh, in all categories. Uh, and the HRA ended high, though yeah, the trend did slow down a bit. You can see that's this purple line there. Um, and you can see this is the HRA budget in blue and actual in red since 2012-13. Uh, it's been tightened up. You can see a note over the years we've tightened up the uh, utilization percentage, which means how much do we think the district will pay, what percentage of plans will be using the full amount of their HRA, and we reduce that over, over time as we see what, what happens, and we talk to Jay Connor especially about what to expect. Um, and it's been a good trend, except for the last two years, uh, both years over budget after a, a number of extremely low years in a row. So, uh, obviously, there can be some variance here over here. Special ed ended a little over budget. Um, generally, there were some additional services uh, for students that were a little higher than last year, and also during the year, a bus route was added. Um, and that was a partial year, but the bus routes are expensive, and that wasn't budgeted. Again, the chart and the ratio. On the revenue side, the district ended at 101% percent point zero uh, of budgeted revenues. Um, interest income again was, was higher than expected. Uh, it was sustained high rates throughout the year. Um, and open enrollment tuitions into the district uh, were a bit higher than expected as well. Cash flow timing. This is the uh, month over month. You can see, as I mentioned at the start, the, in June, where we book all those entries for revenues and expenditures. And then we can see cumulative. And again, there's that, that big month at the end. But this is where we are, the snapshot at the end of June. That's where, uh, that's where we sit. And we had budgeted a balanced budget with expenditures coming in under and revenues coming in over, we ended with a surplus budget. Um, and we'll talk about this again, or we'll at least see it um, at the budget hearing on September 9th. And we'll talk about it again right now in another format. Um, I'm going to give you a breakdown, uh, a breakdown budget update that has a preliminary budget. And this is. Um, this is interesting, I guess, in the timing sense because this has to go to the paper uh, this week to be published in time for um, our statutory requirement to be in the paper in advance of our meeting. Uh, so what you're seeing now is what's going to be in the paper and at the budget hearing. And there you can see on the side with the budget update, you can see the actual column, and there's uh, on top expenditure, on bottom revenue, and then the net, the surplus, uh, a little over 600000 So in regard to the agenda, I'm still talking about uh, budget update. Uh, the column that says preliminary budget 24-25 is the budget as it stands now with our snapshot of everything that we have um, as recently as we know it. I think some things to keep in mind, uh, the September count has a big impact on what we do. 
because we use, year over year, we use the same pupil count. That's what we do when we're budgeting. We have not done a demographic study. That is our practice. And so, if there are more students, more FTE, the revenue limit calculation goes up. There's more revenue. Uh, and if there's less, uh, fewer students, then it goes down. Additionally, we've seen a fair number of open enrollment applications uh, in, uh, and not as many out. Um, so the people that, the students that are in or out last year would likely remain the same for this year. Uh, and applications doesn't mean that students are coming or going necessarily, but it means they applied. And so we will find out after this count also where we sit with that. Because built into this budget on the expenditure side is a trend of increasing costs that's built in uh, for the open enrollment out. Uh, and additionally, uh, the trend on the revenue side. So there's still information um, to, be, uh, to be gained and learned, and that will be applied to this budget going forward. This is not uh, what it will end up looking like in October when we adopt the original budget. This is a snapshot like we've talked about in previous meetings for previous preliminary budgets or previous check-in. Uh, this is our snapshot right now. This will appear in summarized form, even more summarized than this, in the paper, and then it will be a more detailed form uh, at the budget hearing. We'll, we'll look at all funds, actually, uh, to see how they all ended up and what it looks like going forward. Any questions about the budget side? I should also highlight, you can see the preliminary budget column and it's at a net 423 right now. This, this budget document does not include yet any compensation change. It does include the SRO and middle school athletics and activities being in Fund 80 rather than in Fund 10. If you don't have any questions, you can turn your sheet over. Uh, and we've added a couple, comp a couple um, lines to the the compensation numbers that we talked about previously, just for your awareness to see what steps and percentages cost. These estimates are for uh, staff for Fund 10 and 27, that's staff within the revenue limit. Uh, any of the options above steps only also include the percentage increase for all of our new hires as they're placed on the schedule, so the schedule changes in percentage, they also get that percentage increase. So is this calculated across the board for every educator? I'm sorry, sir. It's across the board for every educator, the percentage compensation? The percentage on the right-hand side, uh, that's based on wages only for returning staff. Okay. All staff? Yes. So you're saying is it be whatever percentage you're increasing the whole grid plus whatever step increase they would get. That's on the, the left-hand side column, yes, steps and then percentages on the schedule. And then the impact, wages only, is the percentage on the right-hand side. For returning staff, year over year, this is what we're saying, the increase in percentages. This is the uh, common practice for calculating that percentage across the state for comparison. But that's just an average of all Correct, positions. yes. Yes, yeah. so some people obviously. Some will be six, six, some yes. So, three. for instance, teachers um, early on in their careers would see a higher percentage, and teachers who have been here and are on the top step of the salary schedule would see a lower percentage than the average. So, can you help, help me out a little bit? So, for the last five years, where are we at as far as increases go with staff increases? So, you know, I mean, just going back a couple years, I just want to understand. Uh, last year was uh, variable. It was steps and 4% for support staff and supervisory support staff. It was steps and 1% for teachers. Uh, it was only steps for admin. 
Did you say 1% for teachers? Yes, okay. steps and 1% on the schedule. All right. In the year prior, so then that was like a what percentage? Like on the right side for teachers, I like, because I asked the same question, Steve, it was 2.4%. 2 2.4, yeah, we got this information the last time and I wrote it down um, when you gave a report. You said for admin it came to 1.5, yep. for certified staff it came to 2.4, and for supervisory or support staff and supervisory support staff it came to 5%. Okay. Uh, both of those last two were over five, but yeah, it was yep. MT. Okay. certified teachers 2.4. Yep. Support staff was 5.4. Four. Okay. And supervisory support staff was 5.1. It's a. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you out. Do you have the numbers for the other previous years too? Or do you uh, the prior them? year was steps in 3%, and I don't remember off the top of my head the prior two before that, but I can okay. obviously look. Exactly. So steps plus 3% was 22, 23 school year? Expenditure side here, if you look at the budget update side of that paper, mm -hmm. uh, the top section, 160,000 co curricular, uh, I reduced that. And we're looking at $65,000 in cost being moved uh, from the budget last year to what would not be in the budget this year. Mm -hmm. uh, year over year, there's some variability. So that's just looking at last year to this year. Prior years, there's some variability in some of the costs. And so uh, the placeholder that we had for Fund 80 for the SRO and for middle school athletics was 150, uh, with the SRO being 55. I think we're using a placeholder now, I'm using a placeholder now of 85 for the middle school athletics and activities. Um, so a total of 140, but obviously that's higher than what I'm moving in budget here from Fund 10 to Fund 80, because we don't want to not meet the cost uh, in a given year. Once it's started, it can be adjusted. It's not um, static year over year, um, but at the same time, costs go up generally. So. Did I answer your question? something tonight possibly I can get that broken down and in, into the paper this week but it, it might also just be in the paper like this and it doesn't it doesn't matter if that's the case as long as we're talking about it and we know what the plan is we did a similar thing last year where we adopted the original budget in October with a surplus knowing that the intent was to use that for compensation so it's a it's a similar thing last year in the paper, it was showing a surplus as well. Anybody have any thoughts on these compensation options? So just to clarify, <clears throat> the left-hand column is, are the options, the steps. Okay. Steps and percent, yep. And additionally, um, doesn't fit exactly, I guess, to talk about it as the agenda um, looks, but the third grade teacher is not included in this. Okay. Okay. 
know we've gotten a couple emails just I think in general I look at um, the cost of living and different prices um, that we have across our country right now and with you know everything I look at what our budget allows um, I guess I would be can I make a can I make a motion? I would, I guess I would make a motion to go with the compensation option of steps and 3% raise across the board for all staff. I'll second that. Any discussion? Okay, um, then I will do a roll call vote for steps and 3%. Okay, I'll start with you. Yes. Steve. Yes. Ian. Yes. Or. Yes. Basically. Yes. Um, so, yes. So logistically, we'll process this as soon as possible. Um, Rod is really busy right now with all the open enrollment, uh, getting everything updated uh, for the the upcoming September payroll. Um, so as soon as possible, we'll do that. We'll communicate when it's going to apply as well, so everybody knows what's going on. Uh, but I don't know that it'll be the first payroll in September. It might be the second. Well, that, include, that includes on back pay for yes. when this contract starts. That's correct. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and as far as um, in the paper, I, I will work to try to update this so that it matches what you've approved here tonight. Thanks for putting that together, Dave and Shannon. Take the time to do that's very helpful. Very detailed. Thank you. Okay, um, and B on that my staffing update edition of a full time third grade position, 24 25 school year. There's a memo um, attached to that. If anybody's looked at that one, Shannon, do you have any further? You brought this up last meeting. Yeah, so um, last meeting I kind of talked about Pam and I have been monitoring the numbers. Um, so that grade right now is sitting at 108. Um, again, overall, good problem to have. We have lots of new kiddos coming into the elementary school and many that want to be a part of third grade. So um, as I have in my memo, uh, currently we have four sections, which would put class sizes at 27, 28 per class. Um, certainly not optimum uh, for that grade level developmentally. Um, so my recommendation is that we add a 1.0 teacher um, on a one-year contract just for this school year. Um, and then we analyze numbers from that point on to determine um, if we still have that level of enrollment to maintain that position, uh, potentially moving it to full-time. Um, but at least for now, getting somebody in there for this school year and then looking at what happens with enrollment. Um, I have in here, and Dave kind of mentioned too, you know, we kind of see this as a separate budget item from the compensation that you just passed. Um, you can see there the number that we use as a placeholder. Of course, this could be a little lower or a little higher depending on who we end up uh, getting for this position, uh, someone brand new versus maybe someone with experience, but you can kind of see, um, you know, what we use at least as a placeholder in terms of the budget. Um, so, you know, looking at, as Dave said, you know, where we ended 23-24 with a 607, 767, 85. Um, as he mentioned, you know, we moved that into our fund balance. Um, so essentially we would be deficit spending out of that fund balance for this position for one year, um, which Dave and I both feel uh, very comfortable with. You know, typically where you get into trouble is if you rely on your fund balance to maintain a position or funding year after year, um, then your fund balance doesn't stick around very long. Um, so we feel that we'd be able to absorb that, uh, you know, for this purpose for one year again and then reevaluating at the end of the school year to determine uh, what enrollment looks like and if it maintains or continues to grow, then this position would pay for itself essentially moving forward. Um, but. 27, 28 in a class for third grade is not acceptable in my opinion. So again, good problem to have. We've got lots of kids coming in. Um, so 
So last uh -huh. meeting, um, the numbers were 104 for third grade, mm -hmm. and now we're at 108. Do you have any updates on the other grades in the elementary school? Um, those were holding steady enough that we weren't looking at adding additional staff. So I was wondering if any have decreased. Any what? Decreased? Have decreased. No. So everything is either steady or right. increasing slightly. Correct. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned last time, you know, JK is something we continue to look at. It's not uncommon even after, you know, the first couple weeks in September that we have kids trickling in, in JK as parents continue to enroll. So that number is is still at a is a, at an okay spot right now, which is why I'm only bringing forward this particular position. Um, I wouldn't reel out. Who knows? You know, a month from now, if I'm back here talking about JK, but right now we're. Holding steady, but third grade is where, for whatever reason, we've had the huge influx of kids. Dave, I don't know if you have anything else to add regarding the funding component. I think I covered it. <laughs> so. Any other discussion or action on that? I make a motion to um, take the recommendation and approve adding a 1.0 um, third grade teacher as soon as possible. A second. All right. Uh, motion to add the third grade teacher. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion passes. That's a six can I have a question? I, can I yeah. ask a question? Sure. Um, so this will, I'm guessing, be posted tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have another meeting for t for you know two weeks to go through a personnel update, and we're looking at starting school next week. Right. Is there a way to expedite that process to make sure that we can get this hired ASAP? If yeah. I look at third graders excited to meet their teacher, they've been you know, notified of a teacher, now that yep. will change. I just want to make sure that we can get this going. As yeah, so Pam will end up sending out some information to all third grade, likely tomorrow, of just, hey, heads up, good news, we have another mm -hmm. teacher coming. Um, we'll post it, so it's uh, posted until filled, so we won't have a, an end date for it. Basically, as people start applying, we'll start interviewing as quickly as possible. Um, you know. If not out of the realm of possibility that we maybe have to grab together a quick special session to approve a staff member, but we'll see how quickly. It's hard for me to say for sure until I see kind of what our applicant pool is. But and we yeah. can, I mean, we've approved the position, so we can start the year at least with a long asab yep. of some type. Yep, yep we've done that before too. Mm -hmm. So. We have a couple things rolling on the back burner, waiting to see what happened tonight, and then we'll get moving. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, next item, items for approval. Anybody up for approving any of the items under number five? I'll make a motion that we approve the 24-25 meal prices as presented, the um, memo from our activities director as presented, and that we readopt policy 5610.01, alternative expulsion hearing procedure, as presented. Is there a second? I'll second that. Great. All, any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. All right. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion passes. Next item. Uh, a few items. For discussion that we brought up to uh, be added to the agenda, um, and just kind of addressing how the board would like to move on. So I'll just start with the 23 24 staffing trends. I think you brought it up last meeting. Um, I guess specific things you're looking for. Yeah. And I'll put it in the board, just discuss them. Yep, specifically special education, just noticing a lot of. looking for information from so I think we talked a little bit about last time but it was kind of the end. Yep. So you are you are you looking for a report out from Shannon or are you looking for 
this an email to all of us who are you looking for? An email is fine. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that one? Just looking for uh, information on this. Support of uh, we've getting. We've gotten information on this in the past. Um, so like an update. You know, from what I remember in the past, we typically have a lot of turnover in our, especially in our social ed support staff. Mm -hmm. And part of, a big part of that reason, I believe, is because they are not full time and because they don't get benefits. So, you know, and we've heard in the past from many of our support staff about the need. I mean, that's why last year the percentage increase for our support staff was significantly higher than for the rest of the staff to try to address that inequity. They don't feel like it was enough still though. Mm -hmm. And you know, the other districts are paying more. And so they're leaving or they're going to other job yeah, opportunities. Or leaving education. I was gonna say other job opportunities. Yep. I, I see it across the board. Yep. I think just in with special ed support staff in general, but I think it would be yeah, how can we entice them to stay? Because it's not always a favorable job and it's and I suspect that's what we're gonna learn. When we get an update report. Yep, give me that. So, with an email, just update on that. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, and then the second item uh, school board listening session with staff. And I've heard of this too, and I brought it up to Shannon even last, last year. We talked about it at the end of the year. Um, I think just discussion on if people are supportive of doing something like that, um, like meeting with just. So like the board, we would split up into two or three person, the way I see this, yep. okay, two or three different um, people go meet at each of the schools and then we just basically meet with the teachers or staff at that school and just get some feedback um, from their thoughts, meet probably without, without Shannon or without Adam and just kind of free back and forth of, questions or concerns or thoughts they had um, and then kind of a report back and then it just this discussion for everybody is you know then you know we want like some type of agenda that hey these are the questions we're going to go through or thoughts and then what kind of report out would we want to give so if people are in support of that or not support of that and that's what we want to kind of run through tonight one of the things that I've been thinking about since you brought it up uh, at our last meeting is that we are having our listening sessions every month before our regular meeting. And in the past, we have had staff come to those listening sessions. And it is an opportunity for them to talk with board members and, and admin isn't there already. So I feel like we're already doing this and providing that opportunity. And the staff have taken um, taking us up on it at times when there's something that they're concerned about? I think there might be some hesitation of some staff to actually come to a board meeting and address any concerns. I, I think this is a good idea. I think it's a way for us to get into schools, meet with staff, and uh, get to see if there's any issues or concerns that they might have that they uh, may not just want to well, I'm talking about the listening sessions, not the board meeting. Yeah, but the listening session here is before board meeting, so it's a half hour beforehand. So. I think yeah. it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea if we, if you can get involvement. It's like the listening session. I mean, there's a lot of them that are very empty. But gotta give it a chance, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I brought it to me and I thought about it too, but I see what you're doing. Um, I think it definitely could have its, its positives. I, I hear saying, you know, um, you know, like concerns, but I'd rather kind of approach it more on a positive aspect versus I don't want it to be a time that it's looked as let's let's meet with board 
to say all the negatives. Um, so if it could maybe instead of being like a listening session, be you know that we attend a staff meeting or something, and then and then stay after. I don't I don't know. I just or have a set kind of um, I don't want to say agenda with staff, but kind of have a set criteria because I just um, I I want to respect all, I want to respect all staff. Mm -hmm. um, including our, our principals and admin in that to say, you know, we're here to, to support you, we're here as board members. Um, but just kind of the way that we go about that to make sure that it's framed correctly. I agree what, what we think we want to do as an out, kind of output from this meeting on this topic. Well, I mean, you can use I almost thought you were going to say outreach, but I mean, it's like having an outreach where you go in there, hey, you know, bring up whatever, or nothing. So, like, one of the things that we, I think we need to find out would be the time to do this. So, like, it's brought up, you know, I think the beginning of the year is a little tough, maybe. So, I'm not saying, like, push it out later, because I think it's kind of what happened when we met on it last spring. It was like, well, let's do this, and then end of the year kind of hit and then we just kind of let it roll so I think you know we get the year started and then maybe it's it's brought up at some of the initial staff meeting days like hey what would everybody think about board member and would we want to do it after school and let's mm -hmm. pick a day maybe that the staff you know want to do this and then we say all right we'll sign up for those days and each board member tries to find one that works for them. And then we kind of think too, I, I agree, I don't want it to be a fact finding wish of, you know, what is your admin doing that you don't like or what it is, but like, what things could we do to come in if we come to other events? You know, how do we get more involved in schools? I think we've been invited to things and that's something right. to think about too. One of the things I don't even know about that we've gone to. So. If I could just give my two cents, yeah. I think something like this has the power to be super positive. Um, I think I've seen it work really well when there's clear expectations. All board members have a common understanding of what it is, what it isn't. Um, I would just, not today, but I'd like to know what, kind of what happens after the meetings. Um, you know, is it a follow-up with me? Is it, you know, whatever that kind of looks like? How often are you thinking? Um, I think it can be great. Um, my opinion is I do think it needs to be structured mm -hmm. in a common way um, for it to have probably the most optimum impact and for staff to have a good understanding of what it is and you know those kinds of things. So it doesn't have to be decided right now, but just some things off the top of my head of to iron out. But could you add to maybe just a note from one of your one of your check-ins with the admin teams to have them bring it up? Yep. And then report back. Yep. To so I'll put on our agenda for next week. We just had our weekly meeting today, and then we'll iron out how they bring that to staff and getting some input from staff of ideal times of day and that kind of stuff. And I can bring it back. What I can want. email it. I can bring it back here. Whatever. But we'll yep. we'll start making some progress on it for sure. Great. I appreciate your comment about start of the year. Yep. You know, maybe give it a, a few weeks, but then we can. Let's get into the year. Yeah. A I think it can be great. So I appreciate that. you bringing it up. Yeah. Okay, good idea. Thanks. Um, board development follow up. So, um, so Wasby uh, reported back. They they would come whenever. Um, they did have a, their cost was twelve to thirteen hundred dollars right now, depending, which is in line with what we had last year or the one session we're going to have. Um, for one session? For, for one session, yeah. So they have like a, they dig into, I mean it's a saying that it's two hours to come here. Two hours. Yeah. So they have, I'll send it out to everybody, their proposal. They have a meeting with the superintendent and the board president and then they have, they review all of the information that we do have already that the report outs that we did and then they set up you know their training off of that 
and then they, you know, they get travel time to come here. So I'll send that to everybody so you have it. And then I guess out of that, set up the day that we want to do that, um, have that meeting. In September, oh yeah, I was thinking right. Easiest would be right after the board meeting on the twenty third. And we could do it following that. We could move that one up to five. And we could do it right after six thirty or seven if everyone's going to be here at that meeting. Thoughts on that date? So I'd like to make a statement about board development. Uh, you know, it's been contentious in this room at, at times over the last month or so, just based on the topics at hand. But, um, you know, we all ran for the school board because we want to make a, uh, a difference, you know, for this district and be part of a thriving district. But when we're elected officials, we come with different opinions. Uh, we, we come with uh, different beliefs. And I think those need to be preserved. And I think the obsession about having board development um, is, I, I just don't see when you're elected to office, you know, why this is important to be team building and group efforts and having everybody try to get on the same page or possibly try to quell some of these speech. So I'm not in favor of board development. I think, uh, you know, in my discussions with other school districts, uh, they don't do this. Uh, I think we need to, we've had a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, productivity, believe it or not. I mean, we got our so back full time. We got uh, compensation here tonight for teachers. Uh, we said no to the unconstitutional Title IX, and that took a lot of uh, back and forth and a lot of debate. Uh, and I think debate is healthy. I think that's going to, what's going to propel us forward. So to all be on the same page and sing kumbaya, comic, <laughs> kumbaya, that's, I'm not, I'm not a fan of, of that. Uh, sorry, that's, I think uh, as elected officials, that's not our place to be doing board development. I, you know, for staff members that are employees, that's different. So that's that's my opinion. Twelve hundred Steve. I don't disagree. <laughs> Believe me, I'm, I'm trying to work on the as well with them. Um, I agree with the same. It's, it's a lot. But I mean Steve, we can have disagreements. We're going to have disagreements. We have disagreements all the time. That's part of being on the board. But I guess it's how we interact during those discussions. And that's what I think we need to work on. Well, it's it's not just the disagreement. I'm, I'm not going to try to make you agree with every word that comes out of my mouth. That's I, I know that. But it, yeah. So I'm just saying robust debate is good. And to listen to our parents and taxpayers um, that's huge. I think at times we get lost in the weeds and we we go off track and we forget about who's paying the bill. Um, you know, we need to run this as our school district as a business. We need to look at ways to uh, stop the bleeding as far as the 1.4 million that's going out to the Wisconsin DPI. Uh, these are important things and when we listen to our community, that's the best development that we can all have here is listening to our taxpayers and parents. That's the best board development that any one of us can have. And, and I think we all do that. I just don't think we all listen to the same parents or hear from the same parents, which is also okay. I mean, there's a lot of people vote in these elections, and there's a lot of people who vote for certain people and vote for other people. And I don't think it's a pretty tight margin so there's a lot of people who I think have a vested interest in this school. But when you win a race, you win a race. That's because 
the yeah, issue. I'm just saying there's a lot of people in this district who voted for you, Steve, I agree, but there's a lot of people who voted for all of us, and there's a lot of people that I talk to who have certain thoughts and opinions, and if I share those, that, that's okay. And if you share the thoughts and opinions that people voted for you, that's okay as well. But then it's how do we then function outside of this room? Because once we make a decision, you know, that's a board decision, and you can have your opinion, but we gotta move on to the next item, the next topic. That's a team. We don't have to vote the same way, but we also have to, if I'm working with somebody, I might not agree with them at every decision they make, but once that decision is made, we all need to be running in that same direction. And we can't have people going off and still trying to run things the way they want to when the whole group has said, this is the direction that we're going. I might not agree with it, and I think it might be better the other way, but this is the, this is the will of the group, and this is the best for the group. That, that's it, all. It just comes back to my point, is you're trying to, to get certain members, and I'm talking about myself here, to calm down and not have the opinions that they do. I have not said that once. I, have, I am open to your opinion. You can bring your opinion, whatever you want. But the results of the... So, Steve, the results of the... So, Steve, so, so, do you want, you talk this Title IX. So, I'm on the, the end that was not for tabling Title IX. You have heard me run around and bring this up to everybody and their brother and speak out everywhere saying we need to bring this back on the agenda. No, our board made a decision and and that's the decision that I'm going with. And if anybody asks me when we're gonna talk about it, I say, when it has to be brought up again. I'm not bringing it up, so I'm not. <laughs> I understand, what I'm saying is, we recently had an election, yeah. and. Really? <laughs> Every yeah. time, we know there was an election, Steve, okay? We know okay. there was an election, we all went through it. Oh gosh, every time. I, yeah, I agree. And to your point, Bruce, all of us were elected. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's very true, but the problem is I've heard things that are unjust. I didn't want to bring any of that up, okay, but we're taking it to the next level here for some reason, okay. I'm trying to be positive about this. Every time I bring up elections because we were elected to office, all right, that speaks for itself. That's what board development is. We need to listen to our constituents. And that's all I'm trying to say, okay? I was looking at the yes. process. Um, I was just looking through the bylaws and I'm noticing that we don't have anything for how meetings are done. And I just think that we could probably do well with maybe a policy that plays out Robert's rules of orders. I can find it. Does anybody know the number? Yeah, it's Oh, it's on the top. It's Robert's rule. What to the agenda? Yeah, right here. Why are we not following this? Why am I not when I want to speak? Why am I not saying, Mr. President? And then you say, Danielle. Why? Why are we not doing that? I, I think we should be doing that. I so you I, already did look at this? Then? No, I, I'm I'm watching other board meetings oh. of, from other districts, and ours are definitely more. The respect relaxed. is greater, I think following that and I think that we do well to follow that. Maybe we could get that with um, our board development. I don't think I agree and I, I've, yes, I've run through these and realized yes, we don't do many of these because they haven't been done since I've been on here as official as Steve, I agree with you. I don't think that team building and everyone on the same page. Um, I think if anything, and I, and I voiced this the last time, that if we're gonna do do it, I think we all do need to be on the same page. I, I, we all need to be, not on the same page, we all need to be open to board development. Because when I do look at the price, and if not everybody's on board. However, I'm gonna go back to our notes from the last meeting and we made a motion to have a WASB consultant work with the board to narrow down our list of items to address and it was passed in a roll call vote. And our policy also states that once we vote through something, we don't go back and re-vote on it. Only a member who voted in the majority may 
uh, bring a topic back to be if their mind changes. So it's back to originally I brought up is just talking about what day we want to do this and we want to do it on the 23rd if people are going to be able to make it on the 23rd. Well, I would be the one that would bring it back then because I think we should have known the cost before we took the vote. And I would say I had, I did not know that's the way the board was going to go. I had no idea, which is why I didn't have any costs because I had no direction. So it's, it's on here now for the 1200, 1300, 1275 or something. It's higher than I anticipated. I guess we can make a motion if we're going to have you know, schedule, if we can't schedule a day, I guess. If someone wants to make a motion to pick a day and we vote against picking a day, then I guess that would be, we wouldn't have it. So I guess the, the motion on tonight would be to bring Wadi in and pick a day for them to come in and do a, a session. Are they we, available September 23rd? She is, she is. yes. And Shannon, based on previous years, does September 23rd look like it's going to be a lengthy agenda, typically? No, I would say July is our lengthiest, mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Um, and we've got the uh, um, annual budget hearing as well. Is that coincide with the work session or the regular session? Mm -hmm. The work session? The work session? Yeah. Okay. What day is it, the 8th? The 9th. The 9th. So I'll make a motion that we um, schedule a follow-up with WASB for September 23rd to follow the regular session. Is there a second? Is there a second? Thanks. I'm just I know still learning. <laughs> Second. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, discussion. Uh, I don't think we should be taking a motion until we see the proposal. Oh, you mean until he emails it out? Yep. I guess what do you want? Just see what's in it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just like I wanted to know the cost earlier. <coughs> I sent it to you before. I sent it to you like two weeks ago. That was after the vote had Right, yeah. But again, I had no I didn't know that's the way the board was gonna go on this, so I didn't have it. On-site work session with the board and superintendent by the on-site. Um, office time review, survey results, prepare presentation for work session, create summary, and then they have the time down below. So it's a not to exceed 1275. And then she said if the two-hour meeting turns into a three or a four-hour meeting, there's no additional cost. Hour, she only charged us for an hour of that meeting time. So with that, as to what Danny is saying, does it go through? I'm sorry, did you send last night? I sent it to you. Just now. So does it go through then off of the survey that we took, the areas of that specifically then what it focuses on? Yep, they would, yeah, she would go through 
and those results and actually take whatever direction we were really asking for. I, I told her that we had to talk about it tonight before getting back to her, but that we were looking for any direction that would help based on the results we have, where, where, where a decent starting point would be for us. Bruce, did I hear you correctly that um, the price did not go up if we went beyond the two hours? Correct. Again, they were also looking at because I said the same thing. I said that's kind of more expensive than I was anticipating. But it was. And again, I get it. I I, I don't want to waste anybody's time. We have long enough meetings, and but I also think it just be helpful to have somebody in the middle just to help us communicate a little bit and just focus on, hey, after looking at your results, this might be a good place to start as a board to work work together or just, and again, I'm not saying we have to agree on every single topic, but it's just working in the same outcome because I think we do all have that same outcome in mind. Have a different thought process on how we think we should get there. So we have a motion and a second for the 23rd. And again, I'll keep trying to work on the price, but it's it's that, and if we go longer, it's the same. That's the max price it would be. And I suppose it won't be as effective. They don't probably do like. Virtual. Isn't that bad? I'm gonna ask her. But we could do Zoom stuff from the website too. They yeah, offer true. they offer all this stuff. Steve, did you get the email? What email was it? The Wasby one? Yeah. That you just sent us? Yeah, just got one. If you want to look at the proposal. I'll pass. I know how I'm going to vote. In, in coming into meetings, we are supposed to have an open mind. That's one of those other things. You know. are, you, are you talking to me right now? Yes. Okay. Yes. I just, so, I mean, if you say you know how you're going to vote. Is, is that on the agenda? I mean. Yeah, it's in our protocol reminders. Okay. And no. our core values. Okay. So, obviously, a few people at the table have a problem with me here tonight. Because I don't want to do board development. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Okay, there's a motion and a second on the table. Does anybody need more time to look at the review? Did Matt provide any feedback from us as far as the date or anything? No. No, I didn't. I didn't want to look at Okay, so we'll do a roll call vote on the 23rd, following the regular meeting. Um, Lindsay, I'll start with you. Mm, yes. Lori. Yes. Ian. No. Steve. No. Danny. Did it cost? No. Bruce. Yes. So three three means it does not pass. Um, is there a cost that you would be looking for? Because there are some other options we could bring up if we wanted to talk about board development. Um, that would be much less if we wanted to just bring someone in again who wasn't wanting. Okay, um, so with that anything else to add on the policy 01445? Steve, you also had that for that to be on here. I just had to schedule on for M1, so option two is the Unless that was part of the discussion we already had. We already discussed it, yes. Okay. All right. 
Move on to the consent agenda. Does anybody want to make a motion on any of the items on the consent agenda? I make a motion to approve um, personal update A, personal update 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, General information, September 9th, we'll have the budget hearing and the annual meeting uh, and the work session. Uh, and then on September 23rd, we'll have the regular session with a listening session 30 minutes prior. Um, and then I'll start with district celebrations. Uh, Ian, you want to start? I guess I got nothing. Uh, Steve? Nothing. Danny? I have nothing. Just uh, staff was back today in the building. Uh, and then shout out to the elementary school team, just hang in there. Just, you got a little bit of time. Just I've talked to people from some other districts and their buildings aren't even gonna be ready by the time their school starts. And I know ours is looking close, but just hang in there, it'll be, it'll be happy once you know, can probably get past Labor Day maybe, but just hang in there and keep letting people know when you need things done in your classroom because there are going to be things that come up on that construction that we're done that you probably have questions about. So just keep bringing those up and say, thanks for pushing everybody to get that done and working with the people moving in, moving in that building. Yeah, welcome back to the 24-25 school year. And I know there were elementary staff here last week for many days prior to their official first day of school, uh, working on getting their rooms put back together. So thank you so much for all of your work. Um, open house coming up on Wednesday, right? Yep. And uh, the music department mom sale, you can still order your mom's, but it has to be done by August 22nd, by a certain time that I don't remember. But it's in the Spartan School. Do you remember, Alicia? I don't want to have my hands, sorry. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, there's a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Second. See you second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll adjourn at 7.